London, England, December 3, 1968. Alone in a hotel room, a statuesque African-American woman rises from a bed where she's been writing. She's been here for months, working on an autobiography that her friends practically dared her to write. She walks to a nightstand and sips on a glass of sherry, her nerves frayed. She's just relived a horrific moment from her childhood, and it's shaken her resolve. The faces of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. creep into her mind's eye. She'd come so close to working with them, only to lose them both to assassin's bullets. She sheds a few tears, then takes a deep breath and returns to her work. This woman is Maya Angelou, and the autobiography that she's writing will be her crowning literary achievement. I know why the caged bird sings. And though sad in this moment, Dr. Angelou's pain will eventually give birth to great joy. This episode is brought to you by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. We know there can be a lot of barriers that keep you and your family from getting into a clinic, but they're here to help. Plus, children from birth to age 21 may even qualify for free checkups. Learn more at u21checkups.com. Marguerite Johnson, later known as Maya Angelou, was only three years old when she and her four-year-old brother Bailey were shipped off to her grandmother in Stamps, Arkansas. You see, their parents, Bailey Sr. and Vivian, had just ended their marriage and were ill-equipped to deal with raising two youngsters. So the job fell to their grandmother on their father's side, Mrs. Henderson, who, while strict, was loving and protective. Compared to many growing up in the Great Depression, their lives were nearly idyllic. The siblings were bright, close, and their family financially secure. Yet there were still times they'd be harshly reminded of their social status. Encounters with white neighbors were rarely pleasant, and even the white children who lived on Mrs. Henderson's property would stop by the general store she owned and speak disrespectfully to her. They knew that she could do nothing without being lynched. Lynching was so prevalent in stamps that blacks avoided specific areas at night, and if there was even rumors that a black man had so much as flirted with a white woman, everyone would lay low. In fact, Mrs. Henderson even had secret compartments in her store built to hide black men whenever the lynching parties were about and the children would help their grandmother hide these men, while also running the store, feeding her animals, and studying. But the stability of her grandmother's store also gave little Marguerite, nicknamed Maya by Bailey Jr., the time to become a voracious reader. Though that stability would be usurped a few years later, when their father showed up to drive them back to their mother and her family in St. Louis. Angelou describes her mother as strikingly beautiful, and her maternal grandparents, a throaty German-accented woman and a Haitian man, both very erudite. And this side of the family would turn out to be heavily influential as far as local law enforcement was concerned, which will come into play later. The kids also met their mother's boyfriend, Mr. Freeman, and they'd all end up living together while the children adjusted from the simple rustic life of stamps to the loud brashness of St. Louis. At the time, Vivian was working as a nightclub performer, which was something that didn't always sit well with Freeman, whose ego was often bruised by her late nights. But it would turn out that Freeman was not just a jealous boyfriend, but also a monster. Now, due to the severity of what transpired, and because Maya would go on to write about her trauma in her own words once she grew up, we're not going to go into the details of Freeman's horrendous acts here. But it was around this time that he sexually assaulted Maya when she was only eight. Freeman then threatened to kill her brother Bailey if Maya ever told anyone. But Bailey managed to get her to tell him what happened, and he told the rest of the family. Freeman was then arrested, but released after a lawyer tripped up poor Maya while she told her story. Though not long after, the police found Freeman stomped to death. Now it's commonly believed that the killers were Maya's uncles, Tootie, Tom, and Ira Baxter. However, because of the family's previously mentioned political sway, they were never charged and no one knows for sure. And while most people would most certainly say good riddance, we do have to remember that Maya was only a child. In her mind, she had caused Freeman's death with her words. The guilt engulfed her to the point that she decided never to speak again. And after some time, Vivian sent the sullen child and her brother back to Arkansas. Returned, she resumed her old life, but only spoke to Bailey. This went on for five years, until a local educator named Bertha Flowers sat down with her and encouraged Maya into reciting poetry out loud. Freed from her self-induced penance, she would go back to being as normal as a black kid could be in a racist town. And it was during this time she had an epiphany, courtesy of a speaker at her middle school graduation. The man, a local white politician, gave a condescending diatribe that insinuated that because they were black, Maya's graduating classmates wouldn't amount to anything. This incited her to the point of rage, and she determined right there that no one would ever put limits on her. Years later, she would find herself 16 and taller than most people. 
Relocating to San Francisco and reunited with her mother, Maya employed persistence and some liberal storytelling to break the color barrier and get hired as a trolley car operator. Then, a teenage love affair produced her son Guy, and she worked as a cook and a waitress before marrying a Greek carpenter named Tosh Angelos. And while that marriage didn't last, it did give Maya the origin point for her famous last name, one she would use as she embarked on a stage career. Maya loved to dance, and after some formal training, did so professionally. In 1954, she went on tour with the Gershwin opera Porgy and Bess, which then led to a recording deal and club dates in Vegas, where she sang Calypso, among other things. Though as much as she enjoyed dancing and singing, nothing could ever take the place of her love of writing. And after migrating again, this time to New York, she joined the Harlem Writers Guild at the behest of the legendary James Baldwin, who turned out to be a great friend and advocate. Always one to multitask, Maya also began working for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in New York. But that came to an end when she fell in love with Ghanaian political activist Vasumzi El Maki and briefly moved to his home country. But when that marriage ended, she returned to the U.S. in order to work closely with none other than Malcolm X. Though before they could get started, he was assassinated. Mortified, she buried herself in singing and re-energized her activism, in some cases putting herself in physical jeopardy. She again caught the attention of Dr. King, who would once more enlist her help. But just like with Malcolm X, King was shot before things could get going. In fact, he was murdered on her birthday, prompting her to stop celebrating the occasion for years. Her mentor Baldwin tried to pull her out of her grief by convincing her to write a book, knowing that she'd only attempt it if he said that writing a literary biography was impossible, which turned out to be just the kind of push she needed. She went to London, checked into a hotel, and delved deep into her pain and memory. Published in 1969, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings permanently changed both autobiographical writing and many people's views on race. No one had told the story of black women like this before, and never so powerfully. The book sold over 4 million copies and made black women all over the world feel heard, validated, and represented. Many of her over 30 subsequent novels would also be autobiographical, like Heart of a Woman, which further explored her feelings of loss over Malcolm and Martin, as well as what she went through as a single mother both in America and abroad. And while these stories of her trials and tribulations galvanized her fan base, it was her poetry collection, Phenomenal Woman, that would inspire generations. Her words helped encourage and fortify the legacies of many other great black women, like Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, and Maxine Waters. And Oprah, in fact, was actually mentored by Maya, which might explain why she's such a powerhouse. And then in May of 2014, after a life well-lived and full of wonders, Maya Angelou's powerful heart finally gave out and she laid down her burden of trying to make the world a better place. It's no secret that black women have had to endure so much in America, from the legacies of slavery and sexual violence, to losing their loved ones to police brutality, and all while often being marginalized, given fewer opportunities, and being subjected to microaggressions. However, for many, it was Maya Angelou who reflected their own strength back at them with unmatched sophistication and eloquence. Her life and her words, strengthening the resolve of millions. Once again, thanks so much to the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota for sponsoring this episode. Remember, it's important for children to get annual checkups because they're a great and proactive way of identifying symptoms, addressing concerns, and setting a baseline for their happy, healthy future. Not to mention, Child and Teen Checkups also provides free mental health screenings for those under 21. You can learn more and see if your child qualifies for free checkups over at u21checkups.com. That's the letter U, 21, checkups.com. The biggest EC thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons. 